Back when Apollo missions were launched, astronauts returning from the Moon claimed that moon dust, the gray sand-like dust covering much of the satellite's surface, smelled and tasted – yes, they actually tasted it – like gunpowder. But the stuff moon dust is made of is nothing like gunpowder. About half of its composition is silicon dioxide glass from impacts with meteorites. They hit the surface of the Moon at incredible speeds. Whoa! The high temperature makes the topsoil fuse into glass, and the impact shatters it right afterwards, creating the gray and clingy dust. The rest of moon dust ingredients are minerals such as iron, calcium, and magnesium, while old-fashioned gunpowder consists mainly of saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur. In other words, moon dust shouldn't smell like gunpowder, but it does. Besides, when astronauts brought samples of it back to Earth, there was no smell left at all. One explanation could be that the Moon is similar, in a way, to Earth's sand deserts like the Sahara. It's extremely dry and arid. When you sniff the air in a desert, you don't smell anything. But if you get caught in the rain there, the moisture will raise all kinds of odors from the ground that were previously trapped in the dry sand. With moon dust, it might be similar. While on the surface of the moon, it doesn't smell at all. Not that the astronauts could sniff at it wearing their spacesuits, though. But when brought back inside the landing module, the dust came into contact with moisture in the air and started emitting its strange odor. Another reason for this could be a reaction of moon dust to the solar wind. Ionized particles from the sun hit the bare surface of the moon and stay there. There's no thick atmosphere to protect it from those ions, so they travel freely right to the ground. They're very lightweight, so they can fly off and sort of evaporate from the slightest of nudges. And when astronauts took the moon dust samples to the landing module, those particles could have started moving around and giving off the specific smell. This might also explain why the samples didn't keep their odor when brought back to Earth. Since the particles are so light, they might have flown off the samples already in the landing module. And when they were placed in airtight containers, there were little or no ions left on them. Another explanation is that those airtight containers weren't so airtight after all. Moon dust is basically very small crystals with extremely sharp edges. They unexpectedly made tiny cuts in the seals, letting in air and moisture, and so the ionized particles leaked out of the containers. Scientists believe they should study moon dust on the surface of the moon itself to find out everything about its properties. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of craters on the surface of the moon made by falling asteroids, but one of them drew a lot of attention. It turned out to not be just an impact crater, but a tube, looking most like an entrance to a cave system. Scientists found a specific echo pattern that suggested there was a hollow area beneath. They discovered more echo patterns at a couple of places near the hole, so there could be more lunar tubes there. But in this big tube, you could place an entire football field. Researchers believe there could be an entire geological wonderland under the surface. It could be a good shelter for astronauts landing on the moon or even be a harbor for a lunar colony. No one ever managed to stay on the moon for more than three days because of the conditions on the satellite. Wide range of temperatures, low atmosphere, no magnetic field would protect life on the surface from things like radiation or solar wind. Astronauts wear spacesuits. They can't protect them over long periods of time, but a lava tube could. When a lava flow cools, it gets a hard crust, which later thickens and creates a roof over that same lava. It continues to flow, but when it stops, the channel can drain, and that's how an empty tube appears. Our planet also has lava tubes, but they're not as big as the one found on the moon. Back in 1178, I wasn't around then, at least five people in England claimed they had seen the moon split into two from its upper tip. It was in the shape of a crescent at the time of the event. When the crack widened, fire started blazing from it, which the single monk who chronicled it described it as a flaming torch sprang up, spewing out fire, hot coals, and sparks. Then the moon started shifting around and pulsating, but soon stopped and turned a slightly darker shade. The event didn't receive much attention from scientists, though, until the second half of the 20th century. Researchers studied the chronicle and figured out there was a huge, 14-mile-wide crater on the surface of the moon at about the spot described in the book. Only a very large asteroid could have left such a scar on the satellite's face. 
And when they investigated it more closely, they found out it was pretty recent by astronomical standards. In fact, it really could have appeared about 800 years ago. But in that case, millions of fragments from the asteroid and the moon would have hit the Earth as well. And then people would have seen an incredible meteor shower. It would have been very bright, and the memories of it would have definitely been in the archives. But that didn't happen. In addition, many scientists argue that the crater isn't as young as it might seem. The most popular and justified theory is that it's about 1 to 10 million years old. If it had appeared as recently as 800 years ago, parts of the surface of the moon in and around the crater would still have been warm from the impact. The most likely explanation of what really happened back in 1178 is that observers were extremely lucky to see an asteroid falling towards the Earth and burning in our planet's atmosphere. The spectacle would have been incredible, and seen from a proper angle, the burst of the asteroid could have really looked like it was the moon exploding. That would explain why there were so few witnesses of the phenomenon. The right spot to see the show as they did was only a couple of miles wide. As for real events on the moon, water and oxygen were unexpectedly discovered on it not long ago. Water might have been brought to the satellite by asteroids hitting its surface, many of them carrying H2O molecules, and those that are left on the moon in tiny amounts after the impact. There's precious little water there, though. By comparison, even the Sahara Desert has more of it than the entire moon. Oxygen is also present, as separate molecules floating around, so you still can't breathe on the moon. Solar wind brought them there. Waves of energy from the sun travel at extremely high speeds through space, scrape oxygen from the upper parts of our atmosphere, and carry it further. Eventually, the wind with the oxygen molecules reaches the moon. And that's where something incredible happens. The moon starts rusting. There's plenty of iron in the lunar soil, and when it's exposed to oxygen and water, it naturally rusts. Some parts of the moon have actually already turned slightly reddish. they are regions where there's the highest concentration of molecules. If this process goes on long enough, in the distant future, the moon will look like Mars. It will turn orange-red. Yes, the signature color of Mars came exactly from the corrosion that began there thousands and thousands of years ago when there were rivers and seas with water and an atmosphere with oxygen. Another unusual phenomenon is the blue and red lights on the moon. They can be seen when it's crescent-shaped. The flashes come and go very quickly, almost like lightning. And in fact, that's what they basically are – electric bursts. Tidal forces are to blame for this. They cause mechanical stress buildup in the rocks. This can produce an electric field which creates the blue flashes that have surprised many amateur astronomers. But still, there's so far been no green cheese discovered there. Or moon pies, for that matter. Disappointing, I know. Okay, I officially give up on the hope that the moon is made of cheese after all. Wow, not even Gouda. The shiny lunar ball, or a curved banana, or half of a coin, depending on what phase it's in, has different layers inside, just like Earth. One of these layers is called the inner core. About 20 years ago, scientists were observing how the moon rotates. Using that data, they concluded that it had a fluid outer core. But the inner core was hard to study, so they didn't know if it was solid like a rock or molten like a hot liquid. But things are clearer now. Astronomers have collected data from different missions, including the Apollo missions, where astronauts went to the moon and gathered information themselves. Plus, they've used a special technique called seismic data. This method is all about studying how sound waves move through things. Take earthquakes on our planet as an example. When an earthquake happens, it creates waves that travel through the ground. Scientists can detect and analyze these waves to learn more about Earth's interior. The same idea can apply to other objects in our solar system, or planets, or, in this case, the moon. When quakes or moon quakes happen, they generate sound waves, and by carefully listening to and studying these waves, scientists can create a detailed map of what's inside the object. They can figure out things like different layers, what they're made of, and how they're arranged. To check the moon's deep interior, scientists also use something called laser ranging. This method measures the distance between the surface of the Earth and the moon very precisely. And ta-da! Our natural satellite's inner core is a dense, solid ball made of iron, just like Earth's. 
It's about 310 miles wide, which is nearly 15% the size of the entire moon. Researchers also have stumbled upon evidence that supports the theory that the layer between the moon's surface and its core, called the mantle, has been moving around as the moon evolved over time. This movement is something we call lunar mantle overturn, and it could explain why we find elements rich in iron on the lunar surface. Mantle material ends up being carried upward, and the volcanic rock remains in the moon's crust. Some of the materials in this rock were too dense, like me, so they just sank back through the lighter crust material all the way to the core mantle boundary. It's like a cycle where the moon's mantle material goes up during volcanic activity, carries iron-rich elements to the surface, and then sinks back down. There's another mystery scientists have been trying to solve. What caused the moon's magnetic field to weaken and nearly disappear over time? It seems that now that we know about the iron core and the global mantle overturn, we might get some more answers about the moon's magnetic field. Knowing what the inner core is like can help us better understand the moon's history as well as the history of our entire solar system. Now, one of the theories that's widely accepted about the origin of the moon says there was a massive collision between Earth in its early stages and another mysterious object in our solar system. It's called the Large Impact Theory, and this collision was so strong it ripped off a big chunk of the primitive molten Earth. I mean, not so big compared to what's left. If you put a US nickel next to a green pea, you get a good idea of how big our planet is compared to the moon. Now, this chunk was set into orbit around our planet. And this might have happened about 95 million years after our solar system formed. The object that collided with Earth could have been about 10% the mass of our home planet and roughly the size of Mars. Well, it makes sense, Earth and the Moon do have similar compositions after all. Of course, there are other ideas about how the Moon formed. One says that the gravitational force of our planet captured it. This means that the Moon was just an object innocently passing by when suddenly it got attracted and pulled into Earth's orbit. There's even a hypothesis that Earth stole the Moon from Venus. Ooh. In that case, the Moon shouldn't complain. I guess the view is way better here. So yeah, the Moon and Earth are similar when it comes to rocks and some minerals. But the Moon doesn't have the same atmosphere as our planet. Its atmosphere is thin and consists of some weird gases that include potassium and sodium, which is not something you can find in the atmosphere of Mars, Venus, or Earth. And the rocks on the Moon don't contain water. But that doesn't mean there's no water at all up there. A long time ago, in the 17th century, Astronomers saw large, dark spots on the Moon's surface. One of these astronomers thought these spots looked like oceans, and he called them maria, which means seas in Latin. Other astronomers also made maps of the Moon, and they used the term maria to describe these dark spots. For example, Mare Tranquillitatis translates to Sea of Tranquility, where Apollo 11 made its touchdown. But it seems those dark spots are not actually oceans. They are plains made of hardened lava that erupted long ago. These volcanic eruptions left behind smooth, flat areas called basalt plains. In the late 1800s, one sky watcher studied the moon and found it didn't have an atmosphere. Without an atmosphere, there are no clouds and no air to keep water from evaporating. So scientists thought that any water on the moon would just disappear right away. They believed the moon was totally dry. But then, in 1961, one physicist had a different idea. He pointed out there could be water on the Moon in special areas called permanently shadowed regions. These are spots on the Moon where the sun doesn't shine, so they stay dark all the time. Water ice could exist in these dark areas because they're extremely cold and the ice wouldn't evaporate. But when astronauts from the Apollo missions went to the Moon, they brought back soil samples, and scientists found no signs of water in them. So everyone went back to thinking that the moon was completely dry. In the 90s, NASA focused on these shadowed craters and found high concentrations of hydrogen, which meant there could be ice at the moon's poles. They still weren't certain, so they kept digging and, after a while, found hydrogen trapped inside tiny beads of volcanic glass. 
Since there are no active volcanoes on the Moon today, which means water probably was present on the Moon when these volcanoes erupted long ago. Plus, there could be way more water back in the early days of our Moon. In 2020, NASA's SOFIA mission showed us what we'd been looking for for a really long time. There is water on the Moon, after all. It turns out the water is hidden within the grains of lunar dust or sticking to the surface in the sunlit areas of the Moon. So there are no oceans like we have on Earth, but at least there's something. The question remains, how did water even get there? It seems the Moon had a chaotic history back at the time when it was forming, as probably most of the planets and moons in our solar system. So there is some evidence that water came there from comets hitting its surface back in the old days, or maybe even keeps on coming from those that are slamming into the Moon right now. We're talking about a chaotic situation where icy micrometeorites collide with the Moon's surface and dust then makes an even bigger mess when interacting with the solar wind. But we're waiting to find out more about this. Because, as we all know, when you mention water, you also inevitably talk about life. That's why we want to know more, for instance, about all that ice hidden in polar craters on the Moon. Maybe it can teach us more about how life developed on Earth. Maybe comets brought all the necessary elements here. Then, what if there are some of those elements stuck in the ice on the Moon, too? Hmm. It's normal for planets to be a bit tilted on the side. The Earth is tilted at a 23-degree angle. That's why we have seasons. It's summer when the part of the world where you are leans closer to the sun. It works the opposite way, too. It's winter when you lean away from it. But Uranus is tilted more than normal. It lies as a 98-degree angle, which has a huge effect on its seasons. Each season on Uranus takes 21 years to play out. Something to think about the next time we complain that winter lasts forever. Now, here on Earth, we measure distances in minutes and hours, maybe even days. It takes 10 minutes to walk to your best friend's house, or 15 minutes to drive to your favorite cafe. But in space, it's different. It's vast, which means we measure how long it takes to get to a certain point in years, or in most cases, light years. So, if you want to walk to the moon one day, that would take you 9 years to span the 239,000 miles. Perhaps you'd like to take a ride to the nearby star, Proxima Centauri. Maybe if you kept the pedal to the metal at a constant speed of 70 miles per hour, you'd get there in about 356 billion hours or around 40 and a half million years. Trust me, after the first 20 million years, you'd be second-guessing yourself as to why go there in the first place. Now, Mars contains the biggest valley, Valles Marineris, we've discovered so far. It's a pretty impressive system of canyons, 2,500 miles long. It's five times longer than the Grand Canyon. Researchers first spotted it back in the 1970s. A bank of volcanoes located on the other side of the canyon ridge probably helped form this valley. We haven't discovered a planet completely made of diamonds yet, but on some planets, it actually rains diamonds. On Jupiter and Saturn, gas giants of our solar system, lightning storms turn abundant methane into soot, which we also know as carbon. The soot falls and transforms into graphite. Further graphite transforms into diamonds with a diameter of about 0.4 inches. Now, before you start figuring out how to book a diamond-collecting field trip, know that these diamonds don't last. After they enter the planet's core, they melt. Ever notice how when you're stargazing two nights in a row in the same time, let's say 9 p.m., the stars stay in the same place, but the moon doesn't? Well, there are two reasons for that. First, it depends on what time you go stargazing. For instance, if you go outside at 8 p.m., and tomorrow you look for it at 11 p.m., you'll see the moon in two pretty different places. In this case, even the stars take different places in the sky since our planet is spinning. As you know, it takes 24 hours for it to make one full circle. That means, from our point of view, it seems like both the sky and everything up there is just moving around us one time per 24 hours. In the same way, the sun changes its position, rising and setting every day. So, if you went outside two nights in a row at the same hour, in most cases, you'll have to wait for an extra half hour or more until the moon gets back to the same position as the night before. The stars are pretty much standing still. It seems like they're moving, but that's because the Earth is spinning. 
but the moon is actually moving around our planet and goes through different phases. For example, a new moon is when it's completely dark in the sky. A full moon is when its day side is facing the Earth. It takes approximately a month for it to finish one circle around the Earth. Maybe you'd be luckier on a diamond-collecting expedition on this next planet, 40 million light-years away from Earth. Scientists used to call it a super-Earth. Now, a super-Earth is generally a planet way bigger than ours. This planet, for example, is double the Earth's size. It's so close to its star that it makes a full circle around it in less than 18 hours, which means a year there is pretty short. Since it's so close to its star, its temperature goes up a whopping 4,900 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of the heat, in combination with the planet's density, scientists have the theory that its core is made of carbon in the form of graphite and diamonds. Over 10 years ago, astronomers discovered a huge water vapor cloud. It was 12 billion light years from our home planet. That cloud is the biggest source of water we know of. It's also the oldest, dating back to when the universe was only 1.6 billion years old. Now it's 13.8 billion years old. Man, if only I had started a savings account 12 billion years ago. With compound interest, I'd have me quite a pile of cash by now. But I wasn't around then. Anyway, this cloud is so large it holds 140 trillion times the amount of water in all the oceans on our planet. This cloud kind of feeds a black hole. It may also contain enough gases, such as carbon monoxide, to encourage the black hole to grow six times bigger than it is at the moment. The average temperature of our planet is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And the highest temperature ever measured was 134 degrees. Sound too hot? Well, on Venus, it can go up to 900 degrees, which makes it the hottest planet in our solar system. It's not hot enough to melt steel, though. It would need to be higher by 2,500 degrees to get there. But it's hot enough to melt lead. And it's way too hot to sustain life, at least not in any form that we know. Venus is not even the closest to the Sun, it's Mercury. But it has a super thick atmosphere that traps greenhouse gases. It's like you covering yourself with a pretty thick blanket in the middle of the summer. Now, we're used to seeing volcanoes spewing hot molten lava. After all, that's what they mostly do on Earth. But in space, volcanoes tend to spew methane, water, or ammonia. And these materials freeze as they erupt and eventually transform into frozen vapor and something called volcanic snow. I'm talking about cryovolcanoes here. You can find them on Jupiter's moons Io and Europa, Saturn's moon Titan, and Pluto. These volcanoes are especially active on Io, which has hundreds of vents. NASA vehicles have even captured some of these erupting in real time. Plumes of frozen vapor coming out of them extended for about 250 miles. Hey, by the way, they just discovered another moon around Jupiter that might actually be good for farming someday. It's named EIEIO. <laughs> now, what exactly happens to the light after it disappears inside of a black hole? Well, photon is a particle of light. The event horizon is the boundary of a black hole. When something, say a photon, crosses the line and enters those boundaries, it can't escape anymore. But it doesn't mean a black hole destroyed it. It pulls the photon in rapidly towards its center, where an enormous mass is packed into an infinitely small space. But we're not sure what happens to photons in such extreme conditions. It's still one of the biggest mysteries. Does a black hole destroy the light or not? Saturn has 82 moons we know about, 53 confirmed and 29 more that are still on the waiting list to be confirmed as actual moons before they get their official names. And one of the coolest moons might be a 914-mile-wide hunk of rock called Aepetus. It's dark on one side and bright on the other. Its lighter half is 20 times more reflective than the other one. As it turned out, the bright side is ice. The dark side is a bit more complicated. One theory says it's dark because of particles coming from another moon, the one named Phoebe. Another theory says it could be because of heat. Since the moon is rotating really slowly, its dark material is absorbing heat, which makes it even darker. Now, how big do you think a black hole can become? In theory, we can't find an upper limit to its mass. But astronomers believe the ultra-massive black holes, or UMBHs, located in the cores of certain galaxies are mostly up to 10 billion solar masses big. Recently, they even discovered these UMBHs 
physically can't grow much more than this, because in that case, they would start to disrupt the accretion disks that feed them. That way, they would kind of stuff the source of new material. Most people picture the universe as somewhere between aquamarine and pale turquoise. Even some researchers thought that was the case. They managed to determine the cosmic color by combining light from more than 200,000 galaxies within 2 billion light years of our planet. But the real color is actually closer to beige. Researchers got it all wrong because there was a bug in the software. No, really? <laughs> it converted the cosmic spectrum into the color our eyes would see if we were exposed to it. The team defined this color as a cosmic latte. Ooh, make that a double-shot low-fat large to go, please. People stop their cars on the highway, get out of them, and lift their heads in wonder. In the cities, everyone takes to the streets. Balconies and rooftops of houses are full of people staring at the moon in shock. It's red. Some people scream that it's the end of the world. Some seek shelter. Indeed, the usual white moon now looks like it's been doused in red paint. There's no need to be afraid if you see such a thing. On the contrary, enjoy the view, because you have witnessed a rare astronomical phenomenon. This is a total lunar eclipse. Here's the Sun. It's in the center of our solar system. Mercury, Venus, and here's Earth and the Moon. The Earth takes 365 days to orbit around the star. At the same time, the Moon revolves around the Earth and completely orbits our planet in 27 days. The Earth creates a shadow zone, and sometimes the Moon passes through it. The shadow is cone-shaped and gradually narrows. The Moon is 238,000 miles away. That's like nine lengths of the equator. At this distance, the width of the shadow is about 2.6 times the width of the Moon. When the Moon is in this zone, direct sunlight doesn't reach it. That is, it should have disappeared, but instead, it becomes red. All because the sun's rays pass through the Earth's atmosphere. They scatter, and most of the blue light disappears. But the red and orange rays continue and hit the surface of the moon. Voila! You see a phenomenon called the blood moon. By the way, this curvature of light occurs at sunsets and dawns. The atmosphere scatters the blue light, and you see a red and orange sky. If you were standing on the surface of the moon during a total lunar eclipse, planet Earth would be exactly between you and the sun. So you would be able to observe the solar eclipse. The surface of the Earth would become entirely dark for you. All you'd see would be the sun's corona illuminating the edges of the planet. The Earth from the surface of the moon is almost the same size as the moon from the surface of the Earth. Such a red eclipse of the moon is rare because several factors must coincide. One of them is that the moon must be full. Usually, you can see two total lunar eclipses a year. In 2038, you'll be able to see four such eclipses. And the eclipse itself can last up to 108 minutes. But this is rare, and the last time such a long blood moon was seen was in 2000. Many years ago, people didn't know so many facts about our satellite, and the sight of a red moon frightened them. It was a bad sign and a harbinger of trouble. People who knew the schedule of eclipses could take advantage of it. For example, Christopher Columbus had an astronomical almanac and knew when the next lunar eclipse would occur. He frightened the inhabitants of the Caribbean islands when he predicted the red moon. Once upon a time, the moon used to be a red ball of lava. This was way back in time, 4.5 billion years ago. Now this is our solar system. It's full of dust and asteroids. They're constantly bumping into each other, playing space billiards. This is Earth. It's just beginning to cool off from the constant asteroid and comet impacts. But then, Theia appears on the horizon, a planet the size of Mars. It had a chaotic orbit and was approaching Earth in a spiral. A collision was inevitable, and at one point, one of the biggest crashes in our solar system occurred. Theia struck the Earth at an angle. It ripped out part of the Earth's crust and threw it into space. The Earth, in turn, absorbed part of the planet that rammed it. The debris from the collision circled the Earth for a long time. They were a kind of ring, almost like Saturn's. Debris in orbit collided and piled up around a common center of gravity. And that's how the Earth got the Moon. 
There's a theory that this collision helped give birth to life on our planet. Theia hit the Earth at a perfect angle. If the crash had been head-on, both planets would likely have been destroyed in a massive explosion. If the impact had been tangential, then there wouldn't have been enough debris in Earth's orbit to form the Moon. But we got the lucky ticket. The Moon stabilized the Earth's rotation. The collision shattered the planet's solid crust and allowed oceans to form. Remember, water is the basis of life. When the cores of Earth and Theia merged, we got a powerful magnetosphere. This protects all living organisms from solar radiation. The Moon, along with the Sun, controls the tides. Its gravity seems to draw water to it from the Earth's surface. The Sun does the same thing. That is, if we imagine the Earth as a ball of water, there would be two mountains, one on the Moon's side and one on the Sun's side. And as the Moon moves around the Earth, this mountain of water moves with it. If you were in the open ocean with a tape measure, you would see that the Moon is attracting water to itself by about four to six inches. The Moon is gravitationally locked with the Earth. That's why it's always turned to us with one side, like Mercury and the Sun. But the Moon doesn't stand still. It's gradually moving away from our planet, about 1.5 inches a year. Not quickly, but in about 600 million years, it will have shrunk in our sky so much that we won't be able to see lunar eclipses anymore. Do you see this crater? It's Tycho. It's visible during a full moon because of these bright rays that extend thousands of miles from its epicenter. This is the youngest crater on the moon. Scientists say it appeared there due to a meteorite impact about 109 million years ago. At that time, dinosaurs were roaming the surface of our planet, and they may have seen the impact. It was most likely accompanied by a big explosion and looked like a salute in the night sky. Humanity loves to explore the moon. We've sent a bunch of missions there. A total of 12 people have set foot on the surface of the moon. The gravitational force there is six times less than on Earth. So if the average person on our planet weighed about 180 pounds, on the surface of the moon, the scales would only show 30 pounds, like the weight of an average dog. That's why the astronauts moved, jumped, and fell so strangely there. And you would be six times stronger on the surface of the moon. Here on Earth, the average person could lift about 130 pounds. But on the moon, you could raise a big motorcycle or a grizzly bear. The surface of the moon is covered with regolith. This is the lunar dust that covers the solid ground. Such dust is good at preserving footprints. Here's the most famous footprint, which gave birth to many crazy theories. Here's the footprint, and here's the shoe that left it. But the shoe is completely flat. This is explained simply. The astronauts wore extra boots for walking on the lunar surface. They have exactly the kind of sole that left these marks. In addition to the footprints, we left many fascinating objects on the moon. Several lunar rovers, a golf ball, flags, and human waste. There's also a lot of broken satellites and rocket parts. All in all, about 413,000 pounds of human-made objects are there. That's the weight of three passenger planes, or 31 adult elephants. In the future, we plan to resume missions to the moon. New landers will explore the surface of our satellite to find natural resources there. It's also a great place to test new rovers. We're even going to build something like the International Space Station in the moon's orbit, the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway. It'll be a convenient platform for exploring our satellite and launching spacecraft into distant space. If you start from here, the spacecraft won't need to spend almost all its fuel to overcome the force of Earth's gravity. So such a station would save fuel and money. Scientists hope that we'll be able to mine water from the moon's surface. It's been proven that there's ice there, mostly at the bottom of craters where the sunlight doesn't reach. Perhaps we'll send a rover there that can drill down a few feet into the surface, searching for water. Humanity already has the technology to build a full-fledged colony there. It would take up to three days to get there. We just need to get enough solar panels and building materials to the moon. There's no atmosphere on the moon, so potential lunar inhabitants would be defenseless against solar radiation. We would have to build houses underground to provide protection. Modern 3D printers will help make construction easy and fast. However, food and water supplies can only be maintained by constant supplies from Earth. 
The same goes for oxygen. Each rocket launch costs millions of dollars, so for now, colonization of the moon is in question. The moon could also become an object for space tourism. Imagine a spaceship launches from Earth, three days on the road, and you're orbiting the moon. The lunar module undocks, and you land on the surface. You ride the rover, explore the craters, then return to the lander. The engines start, the lander returns you to orbit. You dock with the ship and return to Earth. Sounds like some pretty great plans for a week's vacation. The space crew had been getting ready for the launch for over three years. The preparations for landing on the strange planet included gathering and studying rock samples in the Grand Canyon, exploring ancient volcano formations in the Nevada National Security Site, and looking into gas and lava vents, lava lakes, and pit craters in various locations in Hawaii. To be able to resist microgravity conditions, they learned how to walk obliquely by being strapped and suspended sideways and trying to move along walls. They had to test their limits through intensive diet and sleep regimens to make sure they'd be safe in outer space. It took them three days, three hours, and 49 minutes to reach the surface of this new world in a place called the Sea of Tranquility. They could have gone for the Ocean of Storms or the Central Bay, but they chose this place to land because it had good visibility and it was relatively smooth and easily reachable with as little propellant as possible. One of the first things they noticed when they got there was that, well, the place kind of smelled. This may sound like the beginning of a science fiction novel, but it's actually the true story about how the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. Since then, the moon has had 12 human visitors to this day. We think of it as our neighboring space buddy, but there's still much we don't know about this mysterious satellite. And that should come as no surprise, since the moon is actually always showing us the same face. That is because the Earth and its only permanent natural satellite are in synchronous rotation, which makes us think it's always permanently still. The truth is, it's not in a fixed position, and it is actually moving further and further away from the Earth each year by 1.5 inches. Believe it or not, the Earth and the Moon, although being 238,855 miles apart, deeply influence each other. While the Moon is partially responsible for the tides of the seas and oceans on our planet's surface, our Earth is actually to blame for movement on the Moon. They're called moonquakes, and they last way longer than earthquakes, some of them up to half an hour. It may look perfectly round to us on a warm summer's night, but the Moon is actually oval. The lemon-like shape is caused by the Earth's gravitational pull. Our moon features more than footprints when it comes to traces of humans. In 1969, American astronauts left many objects on the surface of our satellite, such as two golf balls, a drawing by famous artist Andy Warhol, and a message from Queen Elizabeth II herself. One of the last people to walk on the moon to this day, an astronaut named Eugene Cernan, scribbled his daughter's initials on the moon's surface in 1972. Since it appears there's no wind or any other type of weather change there, the letters TDC could remain there permanently. It's actually possible to be allergic to the moon. Harrison Jack Schmidt, an astronaut from the Apollo 17 mission, spent some time in a valley in the Sea of Serenity, then climbed back into the crew's lunar module, but had some moon dust on him. Just as he removed his spacesuit, he got red eyes, sneezing fits, and other allergic reactions that lasted two hours. Since it's so close to us, we've established that the Moon has a time zone of its own. We call it the Lunar Standard Time, but it doesn't correspond to time on Earth. To get an equivalent, the explanation is a bit more complex, but in simple terms, a year on the Moon is split up into 12 days, each one about as long as a month on Earth. Each one of these days got its name after a different astronaut who has walked on the moon. The start date of this calendar coincides with the moment Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, the lunar year one, day one, began on July 21st, 1969 at 2.56.15 Universal Time. Since the moon has a very thin atmosphere, it has some pretty crazy temperatures, both hot and cold. They can go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Over by the moon's poles, however, the temperature is always at around minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. 
humans have tried to trace the connection between our natural satellite and the Earth for as long as we can remember, coming up with words to explain why the Moon's existence influences us so. In the Middle Ages, scientists and philosophers thought that during a full moon, some people were more likely to experience different health conditions. Because they saw this inexplicable connection to the full moon, people with these symptoms were named lunatics, or at times, literally, moonsick. People are not the only creatures living on Earth that are affected by moon cycles. Dog owners are 28% more likely to take their pet to vet emergency rooms during the full moon. You may think that's the reason why wolves have this preference for howling at a full moon, more so in popular culture. But scientists haven't been able to find any connection between wolf behavior and the lunar cycles, so it might as well just be a myth. The largest known crater in our solar system is also found on our moon and is called the South Pole Aitken. This giant formation is located on the far side of the moon and measures 1,550 miles in diameter. One of the many things we've yet to fully understand about our satellite is the unusual flashes of light that can sometimes be seen on its surface. Scientists have named these outbursts transient lunar phenomena, or TLP in short, and they have been seen all over the world for centuries. One of the first instances of TLP dates back to 1178, when monks from Canterbury claimed to have seen a flaming torch on the surface of the moon after the sun had set. TLP does not simply mean light flashes. Reports also have detailed other unusual events, such as gas-like mists, reddish, green, blue, or violet colorations, or even the darkening of certain locations on the moon. Is something strange happening with our moon? Is it the beginning, or did we just start noticing it with the newer space study equipment we have nowadays? There are a lot of different theories that scientists have developed trying to piece together what can be causing these events. The unusual flashes on the moon can be caused by anything from meteoric impacts to electrostatic activity. It's difficult to pinpoint the explanation for each event, since most of these episodes are recalled either by a single observer on Earth or from a single location. The fact that there is noticeable seismic activity on the moon can also explain why we can sometimes see unusual flashes of light on the surface of our satellite. When the moon's surface moves, it can cause different light-reflecting gases to erupt, which can explain luminous developments. Some scientists have even suggested that residual geologic activity may also be the cause. This is all the more shocking, given that we've always looked at the moon as a lifeless world. Did you ever notice that our moon can change its color? There are actually many scientific explanations for that. The moon appears to be a brown-tinted gray when you look upon it from outside of the Earth's atmosphere. When gazed upon from the Earth's surface, the moon appears to change color depending on various phenomena. The moon seen near the horizon will most likely be yellow or red-tinted. The rarer, blue-colored moon indicates that you're looking at our satellite through an atmosphere carrying larger dust particles. The moon can even appear purple at times, but what causes this specific hue is still up for debate. The fact that we don't know exactly if or how much water there is on the moon's surface is not the main reason why we aren't already building houses up there. It seems that radiation actually has a lot more to do with it. Recent studies have shown that the moon's surface has a radiation rate 5 to 10 times higher than that you experience on a transatlantic passenger flight. That also means it's 200 times higher than the rate on the Earth's surface. In future lunar explorations, like the Artemis project, for example, scientists need to take this into consideration, not to expose the astronauts. Named after Artemis, Apollo's sister, this program aims not only to place astronauts on the lunar surface in the future, but also to build some sort of an establishment there to study the moon in safe conditions. While the project started in 2017, the first planned mission is set for launch in summer 2022 with an estimated duration of 25 days. The space object with no crew on board is planned to reach lunar orbit and safely return with sufficient data for the next four-person mission scheduled for May 2024. Artemis 3, 4, and 5 are expected to be launched in 2025, 2026, and 2027 respectively, each with a planned duration of approximately 30 days.